Welcome back, boys and girls. Video number two in our fun installment of the study of genetics. Now, before we proceed, think back to the video you had just watched prior to this uh, regarding some of the basics about human genome, chromosomes, DNA, etc. And the fact that, really, as we've been saying all along, DNA is simply instructions, or really, more scientifically, genes that are coded instructions for all organisms and their ability to produce proteins. Sounds kind of nerdy, but don't worry. You'll all be masters of that information very, very soon. But in order for us to get to that point of mastery, we've got to go back and, and actually a tiny bit into history, if you will, uh, to, to realize how do we know so much about the study of heredity and genetics. Now, originally in our first video, the title had been posted that said something along the lines of Story of a Dead Dude. And since we're telling a story here, we might as well start off like a story. <coughs> Once upon a time in a land far, far away, what a dork, there was a, a monk na named Gregor Mendel. Now, think about what you know about a, a monk. They don't lead wild, crazy lives. They devote their lives to religious studies, and they keep it pretty simple. No iPads, no electronics, no FaceTime, no Skype, no anything but reading scripture, and in this guy's case, studying a little bit of nature and wildlife around him. Now, because of his affinity for scientific studies in nature, Gregor, we're on a first name basis, he's my boy, no big deal, was put in charge of taking care of the monastery gardens, raising some of the flowers and vegetables and tending to them and taking care of them. Now, this guy became famous for his work with pea plants. Just think about him for a second. Take a look at this guy. Not much going on, but there's Gregor, there is peas. Ooh, how exciting. I know. If we think about, as we'll see in a second, some of the things that he did and observed uh, without a lack or a knowledge, uh, a lot of the biological information that we have, it's pretty amazing stuff. For example, this guy did not know about chromosomes, DNA, and really a lot of the things and the information that we're privy to, which makes it pretty impressive. Now, one thing he did know and understand is, uh, and became aware of, is the life cycle and reproduction in many plants, and in peas in particular. Uh, it's pretty simple and straightforward, and it's very, very similar to a lot of the other angiosperms or flowering plants, but in a nutshell, most of them reproduce via what is called cross-pollination. And once again, pretty darn simple. Here is our... Uh, flower and as you can see here pollen grains are noted pollen really is the same thing it's analogous to saying plant sperm they are reproductive structures now notice our little winged friend here lands in the flower lapping up the nectar but then our buddy who now is coated in pollen kind of disgusting take a shower scumbag flies to another flower lands on that laps up more nectar but in the process Notice he's smearing some of the pollen onto the reproductive pistils of the flowers, which are uh, the individual female reproductive parts of a plant. Because notice that these flowers have both male and female parts. Kind of crazy. Yet another thing that we have to keep in mind is that, remember, these cells, these pollen grains, which are really cells, do contain DNA, which, as we know, are instructions. But another thing that guy Mendel, crazy monk that he is, he noticed is that pea plants in particular, because they have both male and female reproductive structures, are able to self-pollinate, which is really is actually even crazier. In this instance, uh, the plants can not only uh, fertilize other flowers, they can, with their anthers, can produce pollen grains, which really are the male gametes, but they have the ability to, if that pollen lands on the stigma here, can fertilize that, and notice right here, these peas. What the peas are, really, are 
fertilized egg cells. Those are the baby peas. Now, we know, hopefully we know, you know, I know, and I know that you know, and you know that I know that you know, we all know, we can take these peas at a later point in time, plant them in the ground, water them, they'll germinate, and will grow into, amazingly enough, wow, pea plants again. Hmm. So let's think about that for a second. The pea plants can fertilize themselves and one another. And as he strolled around that garden in his boring monk life, he noticed that no two pea plants were exactly the same. They came in a wide variety of shapes, colors, sizes, etc. Um, here's a quick and cheesy little snapshot of some of the traits. Notice that uh, Amongst these characteristics, they can vary in seed shape, uh, being smooth or wrinkled. Disgusting, wouldn't want to eat that. Seed color. Actually, it's very, most people think of pea pods, peas themselves rather, as being green. There are yellow varieties. Their shapes, their pod colors, their flower colors, which we'll focus on in just a second. Location, plant size, whether they're short or tall, etc. And, and really, everything in between. So with that in mind, so with that in mind, what did Mendel do? Here's where he got crazy. He set up, without being a scientist, scientific investigations, where he crossed hundreds of different pea plants with different traits, and since time is on his side, remember he is a monk, he had a lot of time to sit back and wait and watch the results, gather the data and tally them. For example, what he ended up doing here was, ouch, snipping off the actual male anthers, the uh, sperm-producing parts of flowers. I wonder why he would do that. Think about that. And then actually would, utilizing a paintbrush here, take pollen from a different flower, in this case a white flowering plant, fertilize the purple flowering plant. He actually forced those plants to reproduce sexually. Sex with a paintbrush, yikes. And all you got to do is wait. This flower becomes fertilized, and inside the babies or the peas develop. Um, one problem there. Do those peas tell you what the plant is going to look like? Mm, no. You have to then germinate those peas, plant them, allow them to grow. And eventually, after allowing them to grow, what did he find? He crossed white flowered plants with purple flowered plants, as we just saw. What do you think he would find? Just like in humans, the babies should probably be a mix. Some white flowered plants, purple flowered plants, maybe. Maybe purple and white flowered plants, or maybe even plants that are an in between color, a blend. That's what Mendel thought. But look at what he found purple flower crossed with white flower, this symbol here denoting crossed with yields, F1 means the first filial, or the offspring generation. Every single one of the offspring were purple. What? Sorry, got a little carried away there. Think about, well, why? You may be wondering, just as Mendel did, why did they all come out purple? Here's what Mendel started to figure out, some of his conclusions, his postulates. He said, well, parents must pass on some kind of factors. We call them genes now, but Mendel didn't use the word genes. He actually called them factors. Somehow that purple and white flower we had just looked at passed on factors to their kids, telling the kids what they were going to look like, what traits they were going to have. Another assumption he made, offspring are kind of a mix. In other words, they get half of their factors or genes from one parent, half from the other kind of makes sense. Hmm. And the last one, which is kind of strange, we're going to look at in an activity after watching this video. When organisms reproduce and they pass along these factors or genes, these alleles, which is a term for different forms of a gene, we'll look at later, separate so that each parent gives one copy of every single gene to their children. Hmm. For example, Suppose a person has two copies of the gene for eye color. 
it's a trait we have. There must be some type of instructions that tell us what eye color we're going to have. And let's keep it simple here. Let's use a big B as a form to keep track of that and say that codes for a gene for brown eyes. A little b will represent blue eyes. When we reproduce, these genes separate so the parent can pass along either the big B for brown eyes to their kids or they could pass on the little b for blue eyes to their kids. It's really chance. In fact, think of math, the idea of probability. Just like flipping a coin, you have a 50-50 shot. You can flip heads or you can flip tails. You have no control over that. It's totally random. Mendel, at this point, was making the assumption that, hey, this passing on of genes must be an awful lot like flipping a coin. Now, what we're going to see in later videos here, because we're done for now, is that it's a little more complicated than that. But for now, let's put this idea into practice with an activity.